The Gentleman, um, which is a new film by Guy Ritchie, which, as far as I understand, was formerly known as Tough Guys. In fact, at the end of the scroll, I think it says Tough Guys is the name of, of the production company, also formerly known as Bush, apparently. Um, we saw this together because there was a point at which the two stars, who was uh, Ma Matthew uh, Ma McConaughey and uh, Hugh Grant, would possibly get to be. Show. But that couldn't happen for reasons of the general election. But we still we, we still ended up seeing the film together anyway. So it's yes. interesting. So we've both seen it. So after, I mean, I was never a huge Guy Ritchie fan at the beginning. You know, I was kind of less impressed by the geezery laddies than anybody else. I, I think everybody was down on Revolver. Then he made the Sherlock Holmes movies, which I did like, in which I thought that flashy visual style that he has was put to good use. Then more recently, we've had things like King Arthur Daily, He's All Right, which was all over the place and seemed to be kind of, you know, going back to your then. It was The Man from Uncle before that, wasn't there? And then Aladdin, of course, which actually turned out to be very successful. I think we had, you know, quite a few listeners wrote in and said they liked it. I mean, I wasn't a big fan of it, but it's fine. So anyway, Matthew McConaughey and, and uh, Hugh Grant um, are the stars. Matthew Mahogany is Mickey Pearson who is an American expat who has a large marijuana business in the UK. That's what the Bush title would have been referring to, I assume. Uh, Hugh Grant is Fletcher, who is this kind of archly camp, slightly lispy journalist who has the dirt on Matthew McConaughey's character and wants something in return. So at the very beginning of the film, and correct me if I'm getting any, any of these is at the very beginning of the film, we see Charlie Hunnan coming back to his house, which is sort of, you know, quite, uh, quite flash. And essentially Hugh Grant is there lurking in the shadows. And Hugh Grant then sort of ambushes him and says, I've got, I can't do that. I can't do a version. Of Thankfully. Fact, we, no, thankfully. Also, we, we, there, apparently there aren't any clips. So you're going to have to live with me explaining what the Hugh Grant... Can, can you do a version of what Hugh Grant sounds no, like? No, no, no it's okay. a camp list. So you've got a camp list. Yeah. Piece of, okay, so he says, I know all this dirt about your, you know, the, your boss, because he's a, you know, a factotum. I know the dirt on all your boss, and I've got this story with all this sort of stuff. And he also has with him a screenplay. So he's got all the dirt that he's going to take to his newspaper editor, who's played by Eddie Marzan in really sort of, you know, a kind of caricature. This is what a horrible tabloid editor is like. Hugh Grant is this kind of slimy journal who's got the dirt on somebody who has got this huge uh, marijuana industry, but also has a screenplay, which then enables him to narrate the story of the film from the point of view of a sort of journo screenwriter. So he, he'll constantly be able to say, oh, well, you need a bit of action in this bit. Now you need a bit of intrigue in that bit. You need a bit of this and that. And he then recounts this story in flashback of how Mickey was thinking of stepping down from his thing and he got involved in a shake-up or a shake-down and then all the twisty characters and all the turns that come in that make this into a kind of narrative. And all the characters in it have all got kind of geezery names. So Dry Eye, Coach, Prime Time, John the Bastard, uh, a character whose name is spelt P H U K and there's a long thing about how that, you know, that's all pronounced. And they're all they're all geezery sort of stereotypes of some form or another. And the whole thing, I think is meant to be very smartly self-referential, very knowing, very, um, you know, very clever. I have to say that I found it coming across as irritatingly smug and a little bit annoying and rubbish. And there's a number of reasons why. And the main reason is weirdly summed up by the appearance of Colin Farrell, who is a kind of, it was, it was in the film. And... There's a lot of speeches in the film in which people say things that you sort of shouldn't be allowed to say, but they're kind of done in this sort of self-referential, you know, geezery, knowing way. But you're saying things that are, that are outrageous we shouldn't be able to say. And I was thinking about, if you think about Colin Farrell and something like In Bruges, there are things in In Bruges in which Colin Farrell says outrageous things, okay? But the, but the heart of In Bruges, because In Bruges is written and directed by Martin McDonough, who knows about the human condition and understands the sort of the Shakespearean nature of really scabrous dialogue. In this, people get to see it, say those outrageous things and Colin Farrell's in there, which always connects it back to in Bruges. But it just sounds to me like mockney British Tarantino fans getting drunk in the pub that Guy Ritchie owns because he's not Martin McDonough. He's the guy who wrote Revolver. Hugh Grant, whose career is actually, he's having a really great sort of career renaissance at the moment. I think he's doing some of the best work he's done. It seemed to me that he was in the film because the film, its portrayal of the press is not great. And of course, as we know, you know, Hugh Grant, part of the hacked off campaign in which 
So this is a chance to play a reporter who's really slimy, taking his story to an editor who's even more slimy. And, you know, the whole thing is sort of like an arch joke about how slimy the press is, which kind of wears a little bit thin. And the story involves endless double crosses and twists, none of which were entertaining, I have to say, for me or surprising. And somebody once said to me, we're talking about, you know, I used to do things like late night review and all that kind of stuff. And somebody once said to me, well, I know you know, one of the problems that I have with those th those programs is that they just sound like a bunch of middle class people who know each other, laughing at each other's jokes. And I'll be honest with you, that's what I thought the gentleman felt like. For all the, the geezery shtick, it's terribly, it's terribly Dean Street. It's terribly Groucho Club. It's terribly, you know, sitting around in a pub I own. I never, I never, I never felt entertained by it. No matter the, the kind of the talent on screen and all the rest of it, for all the stuff that the screenplay was throwing at me, I never found myself entertained. And what happened was we came out of the screening and you said, so what do you think? And I went, oh, and, it, and I think you'd felt, you'd felt slightly differently to me. Well, <clears throat> I think I enjoyed it a little bit more. I mean, I, I have, I share the same intense dislike of Gangster Geezer movies that, that you have um anything that makes them look cool and fine i instantly kind of take against in fact in the since then i heard an interview with a guy you know peaky blinders on i don't know it's a tv yeah program. no yes i do know. Yes, about yeah, yeah, birmingham yeah. mafia and like yeah, the turn yeah. of the 20th century yeah this guy's written a book about the real peaky blinders and he makes a particular point of saying they weren't they weren't cool they weren't nice to women they weren't nice to children they were thoroughly unpleasant people and he was basically saying you know enjoy the television but it's not like that mm -hmm. so therefore whenever i come to a program like this where i feel as though guy ritchie wants to be the matthew mcconaughey character you know that's the guy that he yeah. wants to be I'm thinking yeah fine okay you know we can go with it but it's really these are nasty really vicious uh, sadistic people who I don't particularly find entertaining. However, having said that, Matthew McConaughey is always very watchable, and I enjoyed watching him. And I thought Colin Farrell was, again, Colin uh, Farrell is very, all, very entertaining. Colin Farrell is always great, but didn't you feel? I mean, you've seen In Bruges, right? I don't think I ever did see In Bruges. Oh, okay, actually. fine. Well, what I'd say is, if you want A-list Colin Farrell doing, you know, in, in a film in which the dialogue is literally, pe stop saying literally, in which the dialogue is peeling the wallpaper off the walls because it's so acidic, and then put that next to this, which just does feel like that kind of mock. I mean, this it did feel like a very retrograde step. And I, I want to be clear about this. I don't think that Guy Ritchie is a terrible filmmaker. I know there was a time when I thought that Guy Ritchie was a terrible filmmaker, but then Joy of Joys, he made the Sherlock Holmes movies, which I really enjoyed. And I think on a technical level, there is, uh, you know, there's a sort of skill, there's a skill and what we, at least what we don't get is all those kind of uh, the visual ticks that we, that, that were used in Lockstock and then were reused over and over and over again to the point that they just descended into cliche. But I did feel that this, tried my patience and I did wonder and I wonder whether you felt the same way that it's a very very A-list cast and I wondered what some of them there is one character particularly whose n narrative takes him to a place that I did think I, I'm not sure you have to be doing that role yes and which is which is true. Plus, there's a gratuitous use of Arsenal's football ground, which I found quite yeah. That that was the thing that really got under your skin, I wasn't it? That, I found that very upsetting. <laughs>